USS Maine, ACR-1, is an American naval ship that sank in Havana Harbor during the Cuban Revolt against Spain, an event that became a major political issue in the United States. Commissioned in 1895, this was the first United States Navy ship to be named after the state of Maine. Originally classified as an armored cruiser, she was built in response to the Brazilian battleship Riachuelo and the increase of naval forces in Latin America. Maine and her near sister ship Texas reflected the latest European naval developments, with the layout of her main armament resembling that of the British ironclad and flexible and comparable Italian ships. Her two gun turrets were staggered and echelon, rather than on the center line with the four guns sponsoned out on the starboard side of the ship and the aft gun on the port side, with cutaways in the superstructure to allow both to fire ahead, astern, or across her deck. She dispensed with full masts thanks to the increased reliability of steam engines by the time of her construction. Despite these advances, Maine was out of date by the time she entered service, Due to her protracted construction period and changes in the role of ships of her type, naval tactics, and technology. It took nine years to complete, and nearly three years for the armor plating alone. The general use of steel in warship construction precluded the use of ramming without danger to the attacking vessel. The potential for blast damage from firing end on or cross deck discouraged an echelon gun placement. The changing role of the armored cruiser from a small, heavily armored substitute for the battleship to a fast, lightly armored commerce raider also hastened her obsolescence. Despite these disadvantages, Maine was seen as an advance in American warship design. Maine is best known for her loss in Havana Harbor on the evening of February 15, 1898. Sent to protect U.S. interests during the Cuban revolt against Spain, she exploded suddenly, without warning, and sank quickly, killing nearly three-quarters of her crew. The cause and responsibility for her sinking remained unclear after a board of inquiry investigated. Nevertheless, popular opinion in the U.S., fanned by inflammatory articles printed in the Yellow Press by William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer, blamed Spain. The phrase, Remember the Maine. To Hell with Spain, became a rallying cry for action, which came with the Spanish-American War later that year. While the sinking of Maine was not a direct cause for action, it served as a catalyst, accelerating the approach to a diplomatic impasse between the U.S. and Spain. The cause of Maine's sinking remains a subject of speculation. In 1898, an investigation of the explosion was carried out by a naval board appointed under the McKinley administration. The consensus of the board was that Maine was destroyed by an external explosion from a mine. However, the validity of this investigation has been challenged. George W. Melville, a chief engineer in the Navy, proposed that a more likely cause for the sinking was from a magazine explosion within the vessel. The Navy's leading ordnance expert, Philip R. Alger, took this theory further by suggesting that the magazines were ignited by a spontaneous fire in a coal bunker. The coal used in Maine was bituminous coal, which is known for releasing fire damp, a gas that is prone to spontaneous explosions. There is stronger evidence that the explosion of Maine was caused by an internal coal fire which ignited the magazines. This was a likely cause of the explosion rather than the initial hypothesis of a mine. The ship lay at the bottom of the harbor until 1911. A cofferdam was then built around the wreck. The hull was patched up until the ship was afloat, then towed to sea and sunk. The main now lies on the seabed 3,600 feet, 1,100 m, below the surface. Background the delivery of the Brazilian battleship Riachuelo in 1883 and the acquisition of other modern armored warships from Europe by Brazil, Argentina, and Chile shortly afterwards, alarmed the United States government, as the Brazilian Navy was now the most powerful in the Americas. The chairman of the House Naval Affairs Committee, Hillary A. Herbert, stated to Congress, 
if all this old navy of ours were drawn up in battle array in mid-ocean and confronted by Riachuelo it is doubtful whether a single vessel bearing the American flag would get into port. These developments helped bring to a head a series of discussions that had been taking place at the Naval Advisory Board since 1881. The board knew at that time that the U.S. Navy could not challenge any major European fleet, at best, it could wear down an opponent's merchant fleet and hope to make some progress through general attrition there. Moreover, projecting naval force abroad through the use of battleships ran counter to the government policy of isolationism. While some on the board supported a strict policy of commerce rating, others argued it would be ineffective against the potential threat of enemy battleships stationed near the American coast. The two sides remained essentially deadlocked until Riachuelo manifested. The board, now confronted with the concrete possibility of hostile warships operating off the American coast, began planning for ships to protect it in 1884. The ships had to fit within existing docks and had to have a shallow draft to enable them to use all the major American ports and bases. The maximum beam was similarly fixed and the board concluded that at a length of about 300 feet, 91 m, the maximum displacement would be about 7,000 tons. A year later the Bureau of Construction and Repair, C&R, presented two designs to Secretary of the Navy William Collins Whitney, one for a 7,500-ton battleship and one for a 5,000-ton armored cruiser. Whitney decided instead to ask Congress for two 6,000-ton warships, and they were authorized in August 1886. A design contest was held, asking naval architects to submit designs for the two ships, Armored Cruiser Maine and Battleship Texas. It was specified that Maine had to have a speed of 17 knots, 31 km per hour, 20 miles per hour, a ram bow, and a double bottom, and be able to carry two torpedo boats. Her armament was specified as, 4 10-inch, 254 mm, guns, 6 6-inch, 152 mm, guns, various light weapons, and four torpedo tubes. It was specifically stated that the main guns must afford heavy bow and stern fire. Armor thickness and many details were also defined. Specifications for Texas were similar, but demanded a main battery of two 12-inch, 305 mm, guns and slightly thicker armor. The winning design for Maine was from Theodore D. Wilson, who served as chief constructor for C&R and was a member on the Naval Advisory Board in 1881. He had designed a number of other warships for the Navy. The winning design for Texas was from a British designer, William John, who was working for the Barrow Shipbuilding Company at that time. Both designs resembled the Brazilian battleship Riachuelo, having the main gun turrets sponsoned out over the sides of the ship and echeloned. The winning design for Maine, though conservative and inferior to other contenders, may have received special consideration due to a requirement that one of the two new ships be American-designed. Congress authorized construction of Maine on August 3, 1886, and her keel was laid down on October 17, 1888, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. She was the largest vessel built in a U.S. Navy Yard up to that time. Design Maine's building time of nine years was unusually protracted, due to the limits of U.S. industry at the time. The delivery of her armored plating took three years and a fire in the drafting room of the building yard, where Maine's working set of blueprints were stored, caused further delay. In those nine years, naval tactics and technology changed radically and left Maine's actual role in the Navy ill-defined. At the time she was laid down, armored cruisers such as Maine were intended to serve as small battleships on overseas service and were built with heavy belt armor. Great Britain, France and Russia had constructed such ships to serve this purpose and sold others of this type, including Riachuelo, to second-rate navies. Within a decade, this role had changed to commerce rating, for which fast, 
long-range vessels, with only limited armor protection, were needed. The advent of lightweight armor, such as Harvey Steel, made this transformation possible. As a result of these changing priorities, Maine was caught between two separate positions and could not perform either one adequately. She lacked both the armor and firepower to serve as a ship of the line against enemy battleships and the speed to serve as a cruiser. Nevertheless, she was expected to fulfill more than one tactical function. In addition, because of the potential of a warship sustaining blast damage to herself from cross deck and end on fire, Maine's main gun arrangement was obsolete by the time she entered service. General Characteristics Maine was 324 feet 4 inches, 98.9 m, long overall, with a beam of 57 feet, 17.4 m, a maximum draft of 22 feet 6 inches, 6.9 m, and a displacement of 6,682 long tons. 6,789.2 tons. She was divided into 214 watertight compartments. A centerline longitudinal watertight bulkhead separated the engines and a double bottom covered the hull only from the foremast to the aft end of the armored citadel, a distance of 196 feet, 59.7 m. She had a metacentric height of 3.45 feet, 1.1 m as designed and was fitted with a ram bow. Maine's hull was long and narrow, more like a cruiser than that of Texas, which was wide-beamed. Normally, this would have made Maine the faster ship of the two. However, Maine's weight distribution was ill-balanced, which slowed her considerably. Her main turrets, awkwardly situated on a cutaway gun deck, were nearly awash in bad weather. Because they were mounted toward the ends of the ship, away from its center of gravity, Maine was also prone to greater motion in heavy seas. While she and Texas were both considered seaworthy, the latter's high hull and guns mounted on her main deck made her the drier ship. The two main gun turrets were sponsoned out over the sides of the ship and echelon to allow both to fire fore and aft. The practice of an echelon mounting had begun with Italian battleships designed in the 1870s by Benedetto Brin and followed by the British Navy with HMS Inflexible, which was laid down in 1874 but not commissioned until October 1881. This gun arrangement met the design demand for heavy end on fire in a ship-to-ship -ship encounter, tactics which involved ramming the enemy vessel. The wisdom of this tactic was purely theoretical at the time it was implemented. A drawback of an N echelon layout limited the ability for a ship to fire broadside, a key factor when employed in a line of battle. To allow for at least partial broadside fire, main superstructure was separated into three structures. This technically allowed both turrets to fire across the ship's deck, cross deck fire, between the sections. However, this ability was still significantly limited as the superstructure restricted each turret's arc of fire. This plan and profile view show Maine with eight six-pounder guns, one is not seen on the port part of the bridge but that is due to the bridge being cut away in the drawing. Another early published plan shows the same. In both cases the photographs show a single extreme bow-mounted six-pounder. However, Careful examination of main photographs confirm that she did not carry that gun. Main's armament setup in the bow was not identical to the stern which had a single six-pounder mounted at extreme aft of the vessel. Main carried two six-pounders forward, two on the bridge and three on the stern section, all one level above the abbreviated gun deck that permitted the ten-inch guns to fire across the deck. The six-pounders located in the bow were positioned more forward than the pair mounted aft which necessitated the far aft single six-pounder. Propulsion Maine was the first U.S. capital ship to have its power plant given as high a priority as its fighting strength. Her machinery, built by the N.F. Palmer Jr. and Company's Quintard Iron Works of New York, was the first designed for a major ship under the direct supervision of Arctic explorer and soon-to-be Commodore, George Wallace Melville. 
she had two inverted vertical triple expansion steam engines, mounted in watertight compartments and separated by a fore-to-aft bulkhead, with a total designed output of 9,293 indicated horsepower, 6,930 kilowatts. Cylinder diameters were 35.5 inches, 900 millimeters, high pressure, 57 inches, 1,400 millimeters, intermediate pressure, and 88 inches, 2,200 millimeters, low pressure. Stroke for all three pistons was 36 inches, 910 millimeters. Melville mounted mains engines with the cylinders in vertical mode, a departure from conventional practice. Previous ships had had their engines mounted in horizontal mode, so that they would be completely protected below the waterline. Melville believed a ship's engines needed ample room to operate and that any exposed parts could be protected by an armored deck. He therefore opted for the greater efficiency, lower maintenance costs and higher speeds offered by the vertical mode. Also, the engines were constructed with the high-pressure cylinder aft and the low-pressure cylinder forward. This was done according to the ship's chief engineer, A. W. Morley, so the low-pressure cylinder could be disconnected when the ship was under low power. This allowed the high and intermediate power cylinders to be run together as a compound engine for economical running. Eight single-ended Scotch marine boilers provided steam to the engines at a working pressure of 135 pounds per square inch, 930 kPa. 9.5 kgf slash cm2, at a temperature 364 degrees Fahrenheit, 184 degrees Celsius. On trials, she reached a speed of 16.45 knots, 30.47 km per hour, 18.93 miles per hour, failing to meet her contract speed of 17 knots, 31 km per hour, 20 miles per hour. She carried a maximum load of 896 long tons, 910 tons, of coal in 20 bunkers, 10 on each side, which extended below the protective deck. Wing bunkers at each end of each fire room extended inboard to the front of the boilers. This was actually a very low capacity for a ship of mains rating, which limited her time at sea and her ability to run at flank speed when coal consumption increased dramatically. Mains overhanging main turrets also prevented coaling at sea, except in the calmest of waters, otherwise, the potential for damage to a collier, herself or both vessels was extremely great. Main also carried two small dynamos to power her searchlights and provide interior lighting. Main was designed initially with a three-mast bark rig for auxiliary propulsion, in case of engine failure and to aid long-range cruising. This arrangement was limited to two-thirds of full sail power, determined by the ship's tonnage and immersed cross-section. The mizzen mast was removed in 1892, after the ship had been launched, but before her completion. Main was completed with a two-mast military rig and the ship never spread any canvas. Armament Main Guns Main's main armament consisted of four 10-inch, 254mm, slash 30 caliber Mark II guns, which had a maximum elevation of 15 degrees and could depress to 3 degree. 90 rounds per gun were carried. The 10-inch guns fired a 510 pounds, 231 kilograms, shell at a muzzle velocity of 2,000 feet per second. 610 m s to a range of 20,000 yards, 18,000 m, at maximum elevation. These guns were mounted in twin hydraulically powered Mark III turrets, the fore turret sponsoned to starboard and the aft turret sponsoned to port. The ten guns were initially to be mounted in open barbettes, the C and R proposal blueprint shows them as such. During Maine's extended construction, the development of rapid-fire intermediate caliber guns, which could fire high-explosive shells, became a serious threat and the Navy redesigned main with enclosed turrets. Because of the corresponding weight increase, 
the turrets were mounted one deck lower than planned originally. Even with this modification, the main guns were high enough to fire unobstructed for 180 degrees on one side and 64 degrees on the other side. They could also be loaded at any angle of train, initially the main guns of Texas, by comparison, with external rammers, could be loaded only when trained on the center line or directly abeam, a common feature in battleships built before 1890. However, by 1897, Texas turrets had been modified with internal rammers to permit much faster reloading. The N echelon arrangement proved problematic. Because Maine's turrets were not counterbalanced, she heeled over if both were pointed in the same direction, which reduced the range of the guns. Also, cross deck firing damaged her deck and superstructure significantly due to the vacuum from passing shells. Because of this, and the potential for undue hull stress if the main guns were fired end on, the N echelon arrangement was not used in U.S. Navy designs after Maine and Texas. Secondary and Light Guns The 6 6-inch, 152mm, slash 30 caliber Mark III guns were mounted in casemates in the hull, two each at the bow and stern and the last two amidships. Data is lacking, but they could probably depress to 7 degree and elevate to plus 12 degree. They fired shells that weighed 105 pounds, 48 kilograms, with a muzzle velocity of about 1,950 feet per second, 590 m s They had a maximum range of 9,000 yards, 8,200 m, at full elevation. The anti-torpedo boat armament consisted of 757 mm, 2.2 in, Driggs Schroeder six-pounder guns mounted on the superstructure deck. They fired a shell weighing about six pounds, 2.7 kilograms, at a muzzle velocity of about 1,765 feet per second, 538 m/s, at a rate of 20 rounds per minute to a maximum range of 8,700 yards, 7,955 m. The lighter armament comprised four each 37 mm, 1.5 in, Hotchkiss and Driggs Schroeder one-pounder guns. Four of these were mounted on the superstructure deck, two were mounted in small casemates at the extreme stern and one was mounted in each fighting top. They fired a shell weighing about 1.1 pounds, 0.50 kilograms, at a muzzle velocity of about 2,000 feet per second. 610 m s at a rate of 30 rounds per minute to a range about 3,500 yards, 3,200 m. Maine had four 18-inch, 457 mm, above-water torpedo tubes, two on each broadside. In addition, she was designed to carry two 14.8 long tons, 15.0 tons, steam-powered torpedo boats, each with a single 14-inch, 356mm, torpedo tube and a one-pounder gun. Only one was built, but it had a top speed of only a little over 12 knots, 22 km per hour, 14 miles per hour, so it was transferred to the Naval Torpedo Station at Newport, Rhode Island, as a training craft. Armor The main waterline belt, made of nickel steel, had a maximum thickness of 12 inches, 305 mm, and tapered to 7 inches, 178 mm, at its lower edge. It was 180 feet, 54.9 m, long and covered the machinery spaces and the 10 inch magazines. It was 7 feet, 2.1 m, high, of which 3 feet, 0.9 m, was above the design waterline. It angled inwards for 17 feet, 5.2 m, at each end, thinning to 8 inches, 203 mm, to provide protection against raking fire. A 6 inch transverse bulkhead closed off the forward end of the armored citadel. The forward portion of the 2 inch thick, 51 mm, 
protective deck ran from the bulkhead all the way to the bow and served to stiffen the ram. The deck sloped downwards to the sides, but its thickness increased to 3 inches, 76 millimeters. The rear portion of the protective deck sloped downwards towards the stern, going below the waterline, to protect the propeller shafts and steering gear. The sides of the circular turrets were 8 inches thick. The barbettes were 12 inches thick, with their lower portions reduced to 10 inches. The conning tower had 10-inch walls. The ship's voice pipes and electrical leads were protected by an armored tube 4.5 inches, 114 millimeters, thick. Two flaws emerged in Maine's protection, both due to technological developments between her laying down and her completion. The first was a lack of adequate topside armor to counter the effects of rapid-fire intermediate-caliber guns and high-explosive shells. This was a flaw she shared with Texas. The second was the use of nickel-steel armor. Introduced in 1889, nickel-steel was the first modern steel alloy armor and, with a figure of merit of 0.67, was an improvement over the 0.6 rating of mild steel used until then. Harvey Steel and Krupp armors, both of which appeared in 1893, had merit figures of between 0.9 and 1.2, giving them roughly twice the tensile strength of nickel steel. Although all three armors shared the same density, about 40 pounds per square foot for a 1-inch thick plate, 6 inches of Krupp or Harvey steel gave the same protection as 10 inches of nickel. The weight thus saved could be applied either to additional hull structure and machinery or to achieving higher speed. The Navy would incorporate Harvey armor in the Indiana-class battleships, designed after Maine, but commissioned at roughly the same time. Launching and Delay Maine was launched on November 18, 1889, Sponsored by Alice Tracy Wilmerting, the granddaughter of Navy Secretary Benjamin F. Tracy. Not long afterwards, a reporter wrote for Marine Engineer and Naval Architect magazine, It cannot be denied that the Navy of the United States is making rapid strides towards taking a credible position among the navies of the world, and the launch of the new armored battleship Maine from the Brooklyn Navy Yard has added a most powerful unit to the United States fleet of turret ships. In his 1890 annual report to Congress, the Secretary of the Navy wrote, The Maine, stands in a class by herself and expected the ship to be commissioned by July 1892. A three-year delay ensued, while the shipyard waited for nickel steel plates for Maine's armor. Bethlehem Steel Company had promised the Navy 300 tons per month by December 1889 and had ordered heavy castings and forging presses from the British firm of Armstrong Whitworth in 1886 to fulfill its contract. This equipment did not arrive until 1889, pushing back Bethlehem's timetable. In response, Navy Secretary Benjamin Tracy secured a second contractor the newly expanded homestead mill of Carnegie, Phipps and Company. In November 1890, Tracy and Andrew Carnegie signed a contract for Homestead to supply 6,000 tons of nickel steel. However, Homestead was, what author Paul Krauss calls, the last union stronghold in the steel mills of the Pittsburgh district. The mill had already weathered one strike in 1882 and a lockout in 1889 in an effort to break the union there. Less than two years later, came the Homestead Strike of 1892, one of the largest, most serious disputes in U.S. labor history. A photo of the christening shows Mrs. Wilmerting striking the bow near the Plimsoll line depth of 13 which lead to many comments much later of course, that the ship was unlucky from the launching. Operations Maine was commissioned on September 17, 1895, under the command of Captain Arendt S. Crowninshield. On November 5, 1895, Maine steamed to Sandy Hook Bay, New Jersey. She anchored there two days, then proceeded to Newport, Rhode Island 
for fitting out and test firing of her torpedoes. After a trip, later that month, to Portland, Maine, she reported to the North Atlantic Squadron for operations, training maneuvers, and fleet exercises. Maine spent her active career with the North Atlantic Squadron, operating from Norfolk, Virginia along the east coast of the United States and the Caribbean. On April 10, 1897, Captain Charles Dwight Sigsby relieved Captain Crown and Shield as commander of Maine. Crew The ship's crew consisted of 355, 26 officers, 290 sailors, and 39 marines. Of these, there were 261 fatalities. Two officers and 251 sailors and marines either killed by the explosion or drowned. Seven others were rescued but soon died of their injuries. One officer later died of cerebral affection, shock. Of the 94 survivors, 16 were uninjured. Sinking In January 1898, Maine was sent from Key West, Florida, to Havana, Cuba, to protect U.S. interests during the Cuban War of Independence. Three weeks later, at 2140, on February 15, an explosion on board Maine occurred in the Havana Harbor, coordinates, 23 degree 0807 and 82 degree 2038 W. Later investigations revealed that more than five long tons, 5.1 tons, of powder charges for the vessel's 6 and 10 inch guns had detonated, obliterating the forward third of the ship. The remaining wreckage rapidly settled to the bottom of the harbor. Most of Maine's crew were sleeping or resting in the enlisted quarters, in the forward part of the ship, when the explosion occurred. In total, 260 men lost their lives as a result of the explosion or shortly thereafter, and six more died later from injuries. Captain Sigsby and most of the officers survived, because their quarters were in the aft portion of the ship. Altogether there were 89 survivors, 18 of whom were officers. On March 21, the U.S. Naval Court of Inquiry, in Key West, declared that a naval mine caused the explosion. The New York Journal and New York World, owned respectively by William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer, gave Maine intense press coverage, but employed tactics that would later be labeled yellow journalism. Both papers exaggerated and distorted any information they could attain, sometimes even fabricating news when none that fit their agenda was available. For a week following the sinking, the journal devoted a daily average of eight and a half pages of news, editorials, and pictures to the event. Its editors sent a full team of reporters and artists to Havana, including Frederick Remington, and Hearst announced a reward of $50,000 for the conviction of the criminals who sent 258 American sailors to their deaths. The world, while overall not as lurid or shrill in tone as the journal, nevertheless indulged in similar theatrics, insisting continually that Maine had been bombed or mined. Privately, Pulitzer believed that nobody outside a lunatic asylum really believed that Spain sanctioned Maine's destruction. Nevertheless, this did not stop the world from insisting that the only atonement Spain could offer the U.S. for the loss of ship and life, was the granting of complete Cuban independence. Nor did it stop the paper from accusing Spain of treachery, willingness, or laxness for failing to ensure the safety of Havana Harbor. The American public, already agitated over reported Spanish atrocities in Cuba, was driven to increased hysteria. Maine's destruction did not result in an immediate declaration of war with Spain. However, the event created an atmosphere that virtually precluded a peaceful solution. The Spanish-American War began in April 1898, two months after the sinking. Advocates of the war used the rallying cry, Remember the Maine. To hell with Spain. The episode focused national attention on the crisis in Cuba but was not cited by the William McKinley administration as a casus belli, 
though it was cited by some already inclined to go to war with Spain over perceived atrocities and loss of control in Cuba. Investigations In addition to the inquiry commissioned by the Spanish government to naval officers Del Peral and de Salas, two naval courts of inquiry were ordered, the Sampson Board in 1898 and the Vreeland Board in 1911. In 1976, Admiral Hyman G. Rickover commissioned a private investigation into the explosion, and the National Geographic Society did an investigation in 1999, using computer simulations. All investigations agreed that an explosion of the forward magazines caused the destruction of the ship, but different conclusions were reached as to how the magazines could have exploded. 1898 Del Peral and de Salas Inquiry The Spanish Inquiry, conducted by Del Peral and de Salas, collected evidence from officers of naval artillery, who had examined the remains of Maine. Del Peral and de Salas identified the spontaneous combustion of the coal bunker, located adjacent to the munition stores in Maine, as the likely cause of the explosion. However, the possibility of other combustibles causing the explosion such as paint or dryer products was not discounted. Additional observations included that Had a mine been the cause of the explosion, a column of water would have been observed. The wind and the waters were calm on that date and hence a mine could not have been detonated by contact, but only by using electricity, but no cables had been found. No dead fish were found in the harbor as would be expected following an explosion in the water. Munition stores do not usually explode when a ship is sunk by a mine. The conclusions of the report were not reported at that time by the American press. 1898 Sampson Board's Court of Inquiry In order to find the cause of the explosion, a naval inquiry was ordered by the United States shortly after the incident, headed by Captain William T. Sampson. Ramón Blanco y Arenas, Spanish governor of Cuba, had proposed instead a joint Spanish-American investigation of the sinking. Captain Sigsby had written that many Spanish officers, including representatives of General Blanco, now with us to express sympathy. In a cable, the Spanish Minister of Colonies, Sejizamundu Marat, had advised Blanco to gather every fact you can to prove the main catastrophe cannot be attributed to us. According to Dana Wegner, who worked with U.S. Admiral Hyman G. Rickover on his 1974 investigation of the sinking, the Secretary of the Navy had the option of selecting a board of inquiry personally. Instead, he fell back on protocol and assigned the Commander-in-Chief of the North Atlantic Squadron to do so. The commander produced a list of junior line officer. Please subscribe and thanks for watching.